couldn't, I couldn't resist a, a small sub-reference in the background. Hopefully the copyright... <laughs> I, I've covered the copyright on the end slide, just to say that. Um, yeah, just also to say I'm presenting here as Keith May. Clearly, and I think those of you who've seen me present at other times will know that a lot of the things that behind the presentation here will have been the work of other people as well. I haven't been able to credit all the people involved. But just to say, you know, I, I work for Historic England as a national agency, so I have something in common with our Norwegian colleagues, and I also work for the University of South Wales in a research capacity. So a lot of credit goes to people in those organisations too. But I think, as everyone always says, all the areas are my own. Um, so I'm going to probably pick up a number of things that we've already had in, in some of the presentations before, but I'm going to perhaps delve deeper into the archaeology behind it and look at the, the stratigraphic nature and perhaps some of the issues that pretty came out of, of work on our STAR Semantic Technologies for Archaeological Resources project and particularly the linked data work with, with, with matching data across from different archaeological organisations. Um, one of the particular areas that, that we focused or found, found issues with was, was dealing with, with stratigraphic records and how we would link them together. Going back to basic principles, I'm looking again at a review of the sort of Harris work on, on relationships and Harris Matrix as we know was primarily developed for recording stratigraphic relationships in the field and therefore it, it, the, the principle behind it as we see in the diagram on the right is, is to enable a sequencing, enabling a sequencing of, of, of individual layers or deposits or, or I, items of, of stratigraphy in, in, in archaeology but also as we see it's about the relationships between, very much the relationships between those items of archaeological information. One of the things that, that came out of, of our work was, was, was that whether the Harris matrix in itself was actually the, the best or the only way to, to present that data. And, and looking at the way w that we use the semantic technologies, and in fact Wolfgang's re recent presentation talking about Allen operators, which I'll come on to, and perhaps some of his fuzzy wobbles as well will appear in this. There are more things you can do, I think, and, and, and with, with stratigraphic information, and, and I'm going to present a little bit more about that. Part of this is also, at the end, going to be a plea to all of us in terms of, particularly archaeologists who are creating the data, in terms of how we actually make that data available for those of us who want to work with it and try and use it more, reuse it, and perhaps use it for linked data and semantic technologies. One big issue is, is actually how that, that data is, is stored for reuse. Especially, as I said at the end, for, for what is the best for reuse for cross-linking and cross-searching of data. Just, again, sort of this point that Harris makes it only really deals with the before and after relationship, the stratigraphically before and after. Those, those boxes really have, have that only that link, the lines between them are talking about before and after or equals. As I again showed at the bottom, if you can see it, there is a, an equals relationship. But there's really only those things that, that basically archaeologists are recording in the field. All you know, those that actually do it, not even some archaeologists aren't even necessarily using this, this approach to, to single context recording. But it does leave gaps, I think, in, in some of the records that, that we might be able to exploit with some of the, the technologies that we've evolved if, if we can get the data into the right structure. There is a question around what also that equals relationship means when archaeologists actually use it. And does it mean actually at the same time in terms of semantics, does it mean it's physically the same, or does it actually be is it occupying a continuous space time in the past, but not necessarily now because they dug it up in separate pieces? Um, yeah, that's the highlight. What Harris, I've heard go on about this, people may know this, may not, but what Harris, who initiated this stratigraphic approach to single context and matrix diagrams, says about it is a stratigraphic sequence is a diagram of relative time. 
And he says it shows all four dimensions of the stratigraphic accumulation of a site, unlike the two-dimensional image of a physical world stratified by the seen in a section. Basically, I'm just contrasting in the slide what Harris is talking about is this diagram is represented 4D, whereas this is created 2D. Now, as an archaeologist, I actually look at those two things pretty much the same, to be honest. I mean, I don't really see four dimensions springing out of that diagram, but I, am, I do understand his point that he's trying to introduce time into the, into the matrix. But those of us that read stratigraphic sections can also see pretty much the same thing in that. I hope, hope some of you sort of nod in and get the sense of what I'm getting at. Thanks to Mortimer as well. Right? Um, others have tried variations, or, or at least tried their own versions of, of, of matrix type diagrams. And Car Martin Carver in York uh, produced this, and there was a, I think it was back in the sort of 90s, there was a bit of a tit for tat with, between Harris and Carver over which was, which was the best. And it wasn't so much, I feel, that, that one was better than the other. <laughs> Carver, and I put it, why I put it up here, was trying to do something different. He, again, was trying to introduce a point about sequencing. He was more concerned with presenting the sequencing and the continuity of the relationships in the data than that simple sort of atomic before, after, equals relationship. He also, in those diagrams, talked about groupings and features, and that and just gives you a flavour of this now, because we'll come on to that a bit more in terms of these further relationships and how, how we have seen further relationships between groups and features of, of groupings of context, shall I say, where they represent features like pits, post holes, buildings, etc. And I just again make the point, Roskam, Steve Roskam talked about Carver's relationship, it's more about something that's done in post-excavation. This is another point about how data does a come into the record at slightly different stages in the process. The, the, the house matrix is very much what you record in the field as a field tool, which is great. House matrix, excavation tool, I'm not knocking it at all. It works when, when you use it. But, but there are other relationships that come as well, perhaps with phasing and, and period. And getting on to the point sort of the islands of data, that these, these, sometimes these data in, through this process become sort of isolated in their own islands. Why, why are we not enabling these relationships to be recorded and, and represented as part of the actual process in the excavation? A few people do record what we call phase plans, but they don't necessarily record those phases into, into the data at the time that they're making the context records. They are, they ought to be part of the archive record, but then we're back to this question of are they really very reusable? Here's what, while Wolfgang was, was presenting, I definitely put this slide up, because these, these are the Allen operators that Wolfgang mentioned, and the, the six of them, the, the sort of pair up, the occurs before and after, the, the purple ones are ones that you see and it, that Harris particularly focuses on. Well, I want to talk more about, particularly the, 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 the red and the green ones, which, we'll, which I think we can extract using some of the, the processes that, that we have developed if we can find them in a reasonable form in, in our records. The point about the Allen operators, it says up there, I think that they're distinct, because each pair works as a pair. They're exhaustive in the sense that they don't contradict each other, and they're, but they're qualitative, I think, again, yeah, I love these wobbles to use the thing that they can be up and down on, on the sliding scale. They're qualitative, not necessarily fixed with numeric end, start, and end. Just to give a sense where, where this data ends up in the record, which is part of my point with it's also championing this as, as, as a sort of heritage person in terms of trying to reuse the information. This is the kind of record that I found, we've got this off, off ADS, and it's actually one of ours in the sense that it's, an, it's historic England record, so I felt I'd put this up, and, and there's no criticism of this. It's actually a pretty good exemplar you know, of, of common practice, in, in so much as there is common practice, but there isn't, that's the part of the problem, there isn't common practice. But the point mainly is this, that this is, this is the phasing diagram for a place called Silbury Hill that was dug, and it expresses those relationships quite clearly. Again, we're in this sort of diagrammatic view of data, but it, 
in that you can see the relationship that some of these contexts are occurring during the phase. The dotted line are the phasing, really, phasing uh, segments, I suppose, section uh, delineations between phases as you go up. The, uh, the different phases are just highlighted in yellow. Um, then you, you see within the phases, certainly blocks of context, as you can see on the, in the Harris view of it, are overlapping. They have that relationship, but that relationship isn't held in that data. And the final one here is that certainly the phases, you see where the, the, lines are, the dotted lines meet each other, but the contexts aren't. There is, there's, the lines between them are actually just not data in this format. There's a similar, just another example which I used, which actually, just again, to show that there is no standardized way of really expressing this. A lot of people do it in different ways. These are all in Excel sheets. What ends up in the data, if you're lucky, are these kind of data relationships in database. So the context IDs, the fact that one equal the strat, you know, strat equal ID effectively is one equals the other, and the strat low is one has that below above relationship to the other. And that's pretty much it if you're, you know, and in a lot of cases you don't even get that. A lot of cases we find that only, they're only actually archived as pictures. So something like that might, in fact not even that, a picture would be just held as a PDF of the big matrix. So you've got no data to play with at all. What we can do though, is work with the relationships that there are in that phase and if necessary we actually can rebuild it to some extent if we need to as long as we've got decent phasing and stratigraphic diagrams and pull out these stratigraphic relations or sorry temporal operators and, and stratigraphic relations including the stratigraphic relations using believe it or not the, the operators within used in the CDOC CRM and, and now in CRM Archeo which we've worked on as part of the Ariadne project, which I should also mention, have been involved in with others. One key point, though, again, I wanted to say here is that although you see the relationship before and after, it doesn't necessarily mean meets in time. So there is a hiatus between stratigraphic contexts, and that's just those ones showing up again where we've used them in the modeling and in the databases. Um, I just want to explore those meets and time relationships a little bit more. Um, this is Harris's diagram of his, from his earliest, his work, first work in, in 79, was in, in, in his um, Principles of Archaeological Stratigraphy. And the point I really want to talk about is, is, is the interface and the separations between the concepts. This exploded view of a piece of archaeology he has this lovely phrase, the rope of time, to represent those lines. And effectively, those, those ropes of time, those lines between the different bits of stratigraphy, are like the lines on, on the matrix on the side. You've got them there as well. But their intervals, they're not actually captured as intervals mm. of time in, in, in any relationship in the way that they're recorded in the data. And in most cases, they're actually kind of like cobbled into the actual stratigraphy and layers and records of the, of the, of the blocks of, of soil or deposits that, that, that are recorded. And therefore, so that, again, we're back to that sort of how long are those pieces of string. In some cases, there could be a direct relationship. I'll just make the point that if you had a wall or a ceiling or something that collapsed directly on top of a floor, Okay, the burnt roof or came, came down, you would know there was a, a point in time they actually meet in time. But in most cases, what we're talking about is surfaces that people walk around on, like this floor now. And it's not until it's knocked down that you get the physical meeting of the two things. But that doesn't represent the whole period of time in which we sat here having this lecture. And as I've just pointed to on, on the earlier diagram, the meets in time in this case is probably more appropriate between the phasing 
than the stratigraphic context. However, contexts do get allocated to groups and phases, and then they are more appropriately seen, as we've seen, occurring during groups or phases. So time spans or, or periods may be interpreted for those groups and phases. Group matrices will show all the contexts that occur during the time span of that group. And Harris, again, makes this distinction between something that's a deposition or a non-deposition, like at the moment there is nothing being deposited in this space. Just going to highlight some areas where I think, again, work is being done usefully in these relationships. We've worked a little bit on this in the STAR timeline service, and I know period O as well is now looking at questions of how different periods overlap in time. Previous speakers also talked about this in the context of, of their work. It's crucial that we have expressed continuity of parallel events. So there are sequences within the matrices that op overlap in terms of their time overlap, but they're not. But they are still recorded. That they're physically separate and completely different areas of a site, or in some cases, different sites. But they still, we still have a relationship in those matrices that show that they overlap in time. So things like field boundaries in different areas, large-scale sites, parts of walls, parts of buildings, all of those things may not physically actually relate stratigraphically, but they do overlap in time. And again, what we need is, is perhaps to pull those together. And last part of what I'm going to talk about is, is work I've been looking at with, with people doing Bayesian modelling to try and look statistically at how those things come together. Again, the, the fuzzy, I, just, I think I might skip this as we've got five minutes to go, but this again was, I think, what Wolfgang was trying to talk about in terms of the, the periods and the fuzzy spatiotemporal 4D relationships that, that can occur between. And the key point, again, in terms of the stratigraphic relationship is really, at this point, only, only the one, the before-after relationship and the equal relationships are ones that we actually, that most archaeologists are recording. This is, is an attempt to present the idea that these periods could be the same time periods in different spaces. I think, again, just really I wanted to reference the fact that we've developed more of this work through CRM Archeo. If people were in the other session, we'd be able to actually perhaps talk more about it. But one of the key things we did introduce to RM Archeo is, is the stratigraphic interface relationship so that we can start to actually look at the relationships temporally between some of these interfaces. Although, again, that's more work that needs to be done. So trying to just pull together new work, which I think we're hoping to be doing on this, is joining up where these interfaces that aren't recorded in, in, in stratigraphic records might be used, particularly for Bayesian modelling, some work that's been done. Of, so Harris talks about unrecorded. Harris talks about the unrecorded layer interfaces, and these are brought back into the, at the analysis at a later stage when periods are identified. So he's actually saying in his work they don't record this stuff in the field, but people kind of work it out in, in the post-excavation process. This is this causing problems to some of the sort of Bayesian analysis people that, that treating the layer interface as an integral part of depositional context beneath it ignores the possibility that it represents a unit of time. So that's what this matrix is trying to do, is produced by um, Caitlin Buck and Tom Dyes, is just where the, the slightly wrong, whatever that is, that rhomboid shaped boxes are pu putting interface intervals in between those context boxes. It was a gross simplified, oversimplified, over, oversimplification of that, but simplification even. Um, again, picking up then on the Bayesian chronological modelling, they, they are representing really with their 
phase model in the start and end dates of one or more chronological phases. So here we start to see in the, sorry, it's a really bad photo of a, a piece of a diagram out of one of their papers, but you get the sense. I think again, perhaps the previous speaker was talking about this, and basically in the Bayesian group, they, they were trying to work out the probability where, where there's a gap between contexts. So here's the, the, the crucial one that they do meet in time or that they can overlap. And they're making, again, the point for them that the, the third one isn't something that can be represented purely stratigraphically, yet it is a crucial part of what they use for their Bayesian modelling. So where does this come from? Coming back to work that we've done, we, we in STAR got as far as like interrogating the spatiotemporal relationships. We only actually nested in this diagram the sort of context within a group we tried to get as far as the phases and in fact lacked data because that was data that wasn't held in the database. And that really is kind of my point again. We, got, we were sort of stuck to some degree. We could have re rehashed a load of other people's data, but it wasn't there to, to work with quite easily. If, if we did pursue this, and they're talking about pursuing it further now that more work has been done on some of this and looking at whether we can actually introduce some Bayesian analysis into this, then there's potential to build that up for both phasing and periods, although it may only be at an inter site level, not at the sort of macro level that we've talked about in some of this cross European work. They're just referencing again the, the prototype work that Diane Buck have worked on. I'm getting there. So, sort of bang, bang in a drum then for some of this sort of theoretical work which could be done, but at the moment, one of the issues is how do people record the strat, and as I said, how are these Harris matrices, how are the, the relationships and the stratigraphic information actually archived by people? At the moment, as I said, it, it's quite often just kept as images and not as data, and I really want to say this to the camera, if there's anybody out there, that if, if you are actually recording this information, that please, please, please put your data in a CSV file when you archive it. It sounds really, really basic, but it is actually a big message that, that would, would save us a lot, of, a lot of pain down the line. There may be other, other formats. I mean, people are producing RDF or whatever, that would be fantastic link data, yes. But as a first step, just mm -hmm. I think a lot of our, our work could, could be archived better. Data with CSV can, could easily be converted and used for these. And as some of you will know, we, we did quite a bit of work on that in the Stellar project. So reaching the conclusions, I'm just going to make this point. What we need is more consistent standards are needed for digital records of stratigraphic relationships if matrix data is to be reused effectively, such as something like CSV. We, need, we still need to consider more explicit ways of expressing the spatio-temporal relations within these archaeological records. And I would argue we need new ways to visualize the complexity of those spatio-temporal relationships, extending Harris matrices, not getting rid of them at all but developing and building on them. The semantic technologies offer the possibilities of this that currently, as I think we've, several of the speakers have identified, it's easier or simpler for temporal relations at the moment than the full spatio-temporal relationships. Uh, one, of, one of the approaches I think may bear fruit is representing the granularity of various spatio-temporal relationships, including those stratigraphic ones, along with the other Allen relationships that can help in conceptualizing greater time depth in spatio-temporal relations of our records. And that's it. Thank you.